It's June, so it's LGBT plus Pride Month. And there are some Catholic parishes and Catholic schools that want to celebrate Pride Month by flying the, the LGBT rainbow flag. First, why would you celebrate Pride in and of itself? Pride is one of the deadly sins. And number two, of all the things you could be proud of, why would you be proud of these disordered sexual behaviors or sexual identities? That's what I want to talk about today here on the Council of Trent podcast. I'm your host, Catholic Answers apologist and speaker, Trent Horn. Before we get into the subject of today's podcast, though, just want to remind you, please leave a review at iTunes and Google Play. Uh, consider becoming a subscriber to our YouTube channel. And if you want to help us to grow the channel, go to TrentHornPodcast.com. I got big news. My entire catechism study series is available for all patron levels at trendhornpodcast.com. So if you give uh, $5 a month or a $50 annual gift to become a patron, you get access to my 18-hour-long catechism study series. It'll be immediately emailed to you when you join. So go to trendhornpodcast.com. Uh, at a bronze level or higher, you get the catechism study series. Uh, silver level or higher, you also get my scripture study series. That's 18 hours introduction to the New Testament. You don't want to miss that. Check it out at trenthornpodcast.com and become a patron there. So what I want to do now is I want to read through an article I found in the Ottawa Citizen about Catholic schools in Ottawa, up in Canada, debating flying the rainbow flag as a part of Pride Month. I think they actually want to construct secondary flagpoles to put at these Catholic schools to celebrate uh, LGBT Pride Month. Now, to understand, Catholic schools in Canada are different in the United States. Uh, I have another article here from the Catholic News Agency, and it says, Catholic school systems in Ontario are taxpayer-funded, and schools are not owned by the diocese in which they operate. While bishops set catechetical curricula and ensure sacramental ministry in school contexts, they do not exercise control over elected boards. Provincial governments set basic rules for the operation of those schools. While local decisions are made by trustee boards elected by Catholics at the time of municipal elections. That's why earlier in the article, they're interviewing a representative from the archdiocese who uh, who said that they, the archdiocese, rightfully expect that trustees, principals, teachers, all partners in education will ensure that Catholic teaching is presented, lived and infused in all that we do. So it's a difficult situation up there in Canada. And honestly, I feel like there's a lot of Catholic schools here in the United States. They might as well be public schools with crucifixes on them and the additional theology class that you take. A lot of the teachers are not Catholic, or they are Catholic, but they reject key teachings of the faith, including in sexuality. So there are hardly any Catholic schools that I would send my children to. I've always said, if my kids are going to lose their faith, they're going to do it for free at public school. I I'm serious. Like, there are a lot of Catholic schools where, at least when I went to, well, I, I call them government schools, but you probably know them as public school. I went to public school my whole life, government schools. And at the very least there, if you were Catholic, that was your thing. And, you know, it's like, okay, cool. Being Catholic is your thing. Just like being in anime is that kid's thing, because he's in the Otaku Club, which I was also in. That could be your thing. But at a Catholic school, being Catholic is a part of the authority structure in the school. So to be Catholic uh, means, you know, you're you're part of the the system, man. You know, it's something to rebel against. To be Catholic is part of this entrenched system. And, you know, the, the cool people, the free thinking people, uh, they rebel against that. So it's it's a difficult situation with a lot of Catholic schools in the U.S. And also I've noticed a lot of Catholic schools in the U.S., they say, oh, we're just as good as the public schools. We have our teachers all have teaching degrees from uh, educational colleges. I don't care. Why? Who cares? I want my teacher to teach my kid the Catholic faith, not some humanist dung that they learned at a teacher's college. I don't want them to teach that stuff. Instead of trying, so I think a lot of Catholic schools, at least in the U.S. I've seen, this is the problem they have. They go out and try to get good teachers who've got the teacher certification, everything, even though they don't need it. You can just be a Catholic school and say, hey, we're a Catholic school. We teach Catholic things. Instead of trying to get, quote unquote, the best teachers and get them to be Catholic, you should get the best Catholics and get them to be teachers. Instead of teaching a teacher how to be Catholic, teach a Catholic how to be a good teacher. 
and raise up your school from that level. Otherwise, because some people think, well, what does it matter? What does it matter if the math teacher uh, isn't Catholic or if he's married to a man or something like that? Because here's why. Kids look up to their teachers. They look up to their teachers, and their teachers talk to them about stuff beyond the subject matter. I had math teachers. I had chemistry teachers who would talk to us all the time about politics, about current events. Because when you get into class, you start talking about things that are in the news or things that are going on. The math teacher doesn't only talk about math. And the students look up to these people. And if not only are they not Catholic, but if they live a life that is in flagrant contradiction to what the church teaches— Then you have a problem, and you especially have a problem if you have a Catholic school that flies a banner, a symbol outside of it, that stands in direct contradiction to what the church teaches. That is anti-Catholic in virtue that it is anti what the Catholic church teaches. That is what the LGBT pride flag is about. So let me read you the article. Uh, This was posted on May 24th, so if um, if there's any updated news, I'll try to include an update in the links if I can. It says the Ottawa Catholic School Board will debate Tuesday whether to raise the rainbow pride flag for the first time with a motion that at least one trustee is criticizing for being rushed. Catholic school boards across the province have debated similar motions in recent weeks as the beginning of June, which is Pride Month, approaches. So, I mean, you've already got a problem here. Recall in the the archdiocese uh, and the note from Catholic News Agency, the, the diocese don't own these schools. They can't just put the hammer down. Why? Why? I, I mean, I don't know all the politics behind why Catholic schools are like this in Canada, but they're taxpayer funded. I mean, Catholic schools in the U.S., it's hard to get that funding. It's hard to get people to pay. That's why a lot of Catholic schools in the U.S., they have drifted from their mission because they market themselves as a prep school. I'll get your kid into a good college or we got the best sports teams. And the theology falls to the wayside a bit in order to get people to sign up and to get those uh, those tuition dollars. So I can see how it's tempting to want the government to pay for it. But then look, when the government owns it, then you're beholden to them, which is a, a scary prospect. You you lose your control. And you get these school boards that are supposed to, you would think, oh, they'll elect Catholics to the school board. It'll be fine. <laughs> Good luck. Good luck with that. So it says you're a motion to fly the rainbow flag at the Ottawa Board's Catholic Education Center beginning this June, so that the at their main headquarters. And on a permanent basis at the center and at board schools beginning next year, so not just during Pride Month, but permanently have a rainbow flag in front, was placed on the agenda late last week. Uh, Trustee Spencer Warren, who moved the motion, said it is something he has been passionate about since being a trustee with the Ottawa Catholic School Board. Listen to his, his quote. I believe that everyone has the right to be loved unconditionally and be treated with dignity. After all, love is love, Warren wrote in an email. He declined to discuss his views any further, saying he would wait until Tuesday out of respect for my fellow trustees and the collective board. That's the problem right here. Because what people will tell you, they'll say, well, look, Trent, what's wrong with the LGBT pride flag if what the school means is we are a, a, a school that is open to everyone, regardless of your sexual orientation. We want to lead you to Christ, lead you to his church. That's true. But the Archdiocese in Toronto has a better symbol for that. So what they said here is that in that, so they say uh, in that regard, when they say they want Catholic teaching presented and lived out, infused in all that we do, the Archdiocese of Toronto said, in that regard, the appropriate symbol that represents our faith and the inclusion and acceptance of others is the cross which is visible at the entrance of every Catholic school. It is the primary symbol of our Christian faith. It draws us to contemplate the generous and sacrificial love of Jesus as he lays down his life for all of us. That is the message. Go to Galatians 3.28. St. Paul says, There is neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free, neither man nor woman, male nor female. We are all one in Christ Jesus. The cross is the universal symbol of Catholicism. It is what makes our Catholic faith universal. And to take, here's what I don't understand. For what other group in general do, we don't do this for other, for Catholics, for other ethnic groups, racial groups, national groups. Well, for what other group do we do this? And and there may be, maybe in some specific circumstances for certain Catholic ministries. And even in those cases, it could be justified. But especially, when do we do this 
for behaviors that the Catechism calls intrinsically disordered, paragraph 2357 of the Catechism. Should we fly a flag for those who have an innate, deep-seated desire to be greedy, to be angry, uh, to have uh, disordered desires towards food or drink, towards gluttony, towards drunkenness? Why this particular sin do we carve out an identity that people are put in a box? You'll notice I don't like saying, oh, gay Catholics or gay Christians. Our identity is a son or daughter made in the image and likeness of God. When you put labels like gay, lesbian, transgender, I try to say things like person who identifies as gay, someone who has same-sex attractions. When you put gay Catholic in front or gay Christian, you put someone inside of a box and it limits them. And that box, frankly, the language that is used is not just biological, not just psychological. It is political. This flag is a secular political symbol that contradicts the Catholic faith, whereas the cross is a universal symbol. Imagine in the first century if they said, well, we want a flag that celebrates the Jewish Christians and how much more, spe- you know, that their special uniqueness they have in comparison to all other Christians. But that was dividing the church, especially people who were saying that you needed to be circumcised in order to be saved. So you don't want to adopt symbols that confuse people about the essence of our faith and the the pride flag is one of them. So, you know, some people are going to say, well, look, it's just a symbol describing this group of people. But it's not. It's not that at all. In order, in order to understand that, we need to look at the history of the rainbow pride flag. So this is an article at SanFranciscoTravel.com, because San Francisco is the is the origin of the of the rainbow flag. Um, it says here. In 1970, a self-described geeky kid from Kansas named Gilbert Baker came to San Francisco as an army draftee. Uh, so he, he came there, uh, and then he was a, an artist. Uh, he made clothes and fabrics. In 1974, Baker's life changed forever when he met Harvey Milk, who showed him how action could create change. Three years after they met, Milk was elected to the San Francisco Board of Supervisors, making him the first openly gay person to hold a high public office in the American city. But then, uh, so after winning the election, Melk was uh, later assassinated by a fellow uh, board member, Dan White, uh, who fell into a depression after he uh, he butted heads with people on the board. He lost his job. Uh, he was just in a real complete rut. It was, in, it was suffering from clinical depression, came back into the, the city hall, and assassinated Melk and another uh, member of the Board of Supervisors, a guy named Moscone, actually. And so, so that's just, you know, about Melk there. Uh, and so when after Melk w- won his election, uh, he challenged Baker to come up with a symbol of pride for the gay community. Because prior to that, in 1974, uh, people who identify as gay and lesbian used the purple triangle, the pink triangle, because that was the symbol that they were labeled with in Nazi concentration camps. In the 1970s, they reclaimed that symbol, but they wanted something more positive than the pink triangle. And so it says here, Inspired, Baker began working on a flag. He dyed the fabrics himself, and with the help of volunteers, stitched together eight strips of brilliant color into a huge banner. And actually, the original flag is different than the current flag. The original flag had eight colors. Hot pink stood for sexuality, red for life, orange for healing, yellow for the sun, green for nature, turquoise, blue for art, indigo for harmony, violet for spirit. Uh, Then later on, uh, they they flew the flags after Milk was assassinated. Uh, They they mass produced them and flew them in San Francisco. They actually, it says here, uh, they wanted to celebrate a gay freedom, gay freedom day. So Gay Freedom Day Committee quickly decided that the rainbow flag should be flown from the light poles along both sides of Market Street for the 1979 Gay Freedom Day Parade. They split the colors onto two flags, flying each of the three striped flags on alternate sides of the street. So they got rid of indigo and they got rid of hot pink. Hot pink represented just sexuality. And so they went with the the six colors that we see today. So here's the thing, what it represents, like I think the International Flag Makers Association says that the rainbow flag, the LGBT rainbow flag, is a symbol of the LGBTQ civil rights movement. So it's not just a symbol of people who have certain attractions. It is not a value neutral flag that just designates a certain group of people. It is a flag that designates not only a group of people, but a group of people united by 
not just an orientation or identity, but a value belief that those attractions and identities are good, that they ought to be shared with others, that not only that there's nothing wrong with them, but that they are good, they are a positive thing, and more so that it is wrong or immoral to treat them as if they're anything less than being good. So the LGBT plus flag, you know, the idea of like these so-called LGBT pride parades. Imagine if Courage wanted to march in an LGBT pride parade. Courage, the faithful apostle in the Catholic Church that helps people with same-sex attractions live a chaste life. One, Courage would never march in such a parade because the parade's themes are antithetical to what the Church teaches. But the parade organizers themselves would never have a group like Courage in their... um, in their, in their parade, because LGBT pride is about saying that these behaviors, these identities, they are very good things. And you have people on the Catholic left who say something similar. They'll, they'll say, yeah, 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 obviously uh, sexual activity outside of marriage is wrong, but there are certain positive elements within the LGBT, you know, being LGBT plus that we should, that we should celebrate. You've got Catholics, I guess it's like, there are the Catholics who have gone off the rails, right, and say there's nothing wrong with homosexuality. They're open to centers. There are many other Catholics, though, who will say, uh, you know, you'll take someone like Father James Martin, for example. Father James Martin is very clever. He has never gone on record saying the church's teaching on homosexuality is wrong. He's never gone on record saying that. So he's still priest in good standing. He doesn't qualify for the technical definition of a dissenter. But he plants these, these seeds of doubt among people. And one of the things is is drawing up people who will say, well, of course, the sexual activity is wrong, but we should celebrate the, the positive elements within these orientations and identities. And to that, my question is, well, what? What positive element is there in these identities that you can't just find in the human person himself? What is there? It would be like if I said, I am a proud polyamorous Catholic. If I said, now I'm a chaste polyamorous Catholic, polyamory is having a sexual or romantic relationship with more than one person at the same time. Frankly, we now have serial polyamory, S-E-R-I-A-L, serial, in the sense that when you divorce your spouse, what Jesus said in uh, Mark chapter 10, whoever divorces his spouse and marries another commits adultery. So if you divorce your spouse, but you're still validly married to that person in the eyes of God and the church, and you remarry, that's adultery. That's essentially serial polyamory. Uh, you know, it, you know, you're you're married to to more than one person just in uh, consecutive relationships rather than at the same time. But ima- so that that's a problem in and of itself, save for another episode. But imagine if I said this: I am a polyamorous Catholic who is chaste. I'm married. I'm not sexually involved with anyone but my spouse. But you know what? I am proud that I'm sexually attracted to other people. And that gives me unique gifts to help me relate to the women I'm attracted. I mean, that's total bunk. That would be total bunk. Imagine if I tried to say that polyamorous or adulterous Catholics who live chastely, you could be proud of it. Just don't act on it. But there's things to be proud of. No, not at all. Do you want to know why the LGBT plus pride flag it's not even so much about uh, the sexual disorder, which, which is a problem, which is a problem that 1 Corinthians 6, uh, verses 9 through 11, lists sins. Paul says, uh, you, you, were, you were these, that among those of you who are in Christ, you cannot be drunkards, rabble-rousers, pornoi, people who engage in sexual immorality, thieves, greedy, arsenokoi tai amalakoi, which is the active and the passive participant in male same-sex relationships. It says Christians cannot be these things. And he says in verse 11, 1 Corinthians 9, 11, as such were some of you, but you were washed, baptized, you were sanctified as such. The, now, the inclinations may continue. You're still going to have greedy desires, wrathful desires, gluttonous desires, sexually immoral desires. Because of concupiscence, because of original sin, baptism removes the stain of original sin, but our human nature is still corrupted. So we still feel these desires. But through the grace of God, we can overcome them so that we control them. They, they are at our bidding. They don't just control us. We are not puppets on a strings. We are not marionettes to our own attractions. 
So Paul tells us to, to flee from these things and to find our identity in Christ. So when we find our identity in something that is not Jesus Christ, when that is the primary, our primary identity, whether it's a political party, whether it's a racial group, whether it's a sexual behavior, or whether it's a nationality, whatever it is, if that is our primary identity instead of Christ, and that's the same if your primary identity is being a Republican, being an American, even if it's being a traditionalist or progressist, whatever it is, Christ needs to be our primary identity. And when we find that, every other identity, like for me, what comes first? My relationship with God comes first. Like, I love my wife. I love my children. I do not love them more than God. Because as I believe St. Thomas Aquinas said this, sin occurs when we love the creature more than the creator. Even if the creature is a very good thing. My wife is great. That's why I married her. My children are great. I've been blessed. But if I love them more than God, that'll be a path of destruction. But if I love God genuinely, first and foremost in my life, they, my love for my wife and children and for my neighbor, even my enemies, will naturally fall into place because I have God at the center. So when we fly the LGBT flag, along with creating scandal and making people think sexually disordered behavior, I mean, you go back to the Ottawa school board, uh, Spencer Warren, one of the trustees. His argument is not that we should be inclusive to people regardless of orientation. He's saying church teaching on sexuality is wrong. Everyone has a right to be loved unconditionally, which is true, but it doesn't mean everybody has a right to have sex with whoever they want to. Otherwise, there's lots of people with opposite sex attraction who would like to jump on that bandwagon. But that's not God's plan for our sexuality. And be treated with dignity, absolutely. But sometimes treating people with dignity means holding them to the standards of virtue and goodness that God is calling them to. And this is the code. Love is love. That And that's why, like, what do you mean by that? And he doesn't answer. I think he said the loud part quiet and the quiet part loud in this, uh, in this one sentence. Love is love is just a way of saying, look, if two persons have attractions for each other, it doesn't matter what their genitalia are. So, but the flag, along with celebrating sexually disordered desires that can lead people to damnation, is it's part of a concerning trend that I have seen in... Uh, our modern Christian and Catholic culture of turning our focus and worship and celebration and living our faith towards us instead of being always focused on God. I was at Mass the other day, and they were singing a hymn. What were they singing? They were singing, We Are Many Parts. And I noticed, this is another, the other hymn I don't like is Gather Us In. In fact, I got an email the other day from a music leader who was upset that I had, I had made an offhand comment and I criticized Gather Us In. And he said, you know, I work really hard to lead people in, in worship, and th- why do you have to make fun of it? Look, I appreciate worship leaders who want to lead people to Christ. I totally appreciate that. And I'm glad when we have good music at Mass. But I will not back down from my concern about modern hymns. Not all modern hymns. And I have a soft spot for some of them, because as a teenager, they're what introduced me to Christianity, to the Catholic faith, to lifting my heart up to God. There are some that I still like, but there are others. What I'm concerned is that they put the focus inward. And there are two, so by Marty Hagan, the gatherers, gather us in the weak and the plenty, the weak and the strong, gather us in the rich and the haughty. When When you read through the lyrics, it's singing a lot about who the song is, This is who I am. This is what I will do for God. This is me, what God has done for me, and what I will do for God. I think worship is healthier when we are focusing completely in, this is who God is. This is what God has done. This is contemplating the mystery of who God is. Because, I mean, frankly, this is my concern, that there are a lot of people, including some clerics, bishops, theologians, who have embraced essentially a quasi-universalism, where they, they basically think almost everyone's going to heaven anyways. So if, 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 basically, if everyone's going to heaven, then the only thing we have to worry about is not preaching the gospel, it's fixing what's wrong here on earth. That is the problem, fix, facing the church today, that we have to focus on. I'm thinking of writing, I think, I'm finishing up a book now, but I want to write a book on hell for this reason, that... When you lose sight of that, when you lose sight of what is the greatest threat 
to our existence of living apart from God for all eternity. If you think everyone's going to heaven anyways, yeah, you're just going to focus on fixing problems here on earth, like poverty, like discrimination. And we should fix these problems. The very first Christians had hell completely forefront of their minds to save their pagan neighbor from damnation. But that did not stop the first Christians from also going out and finding children who had been abandoned in the woods to be eaten by wolves. That was the original abortion. Remember, abortions, a recent phenomena because of the growth in surgery and antibiotics and things like that. In the ancient and medieval church, if you had a baby you wanted to get rid of, you just gave birth to the baby and you left him in the woods. And some animals would eat him or they'd die of exposure. And Christians were preaching the gospel authentically to their neighbor and helping the poor, rescuing babies who were being left to die, even though it was technically illegal for them to do that. In ancient Rome, the doctrine of pater familias said the father could do whatever he wants with his family. It was his family, his choice. Does that sound familiar? So it's not an either or. You can focus on preaching the good news of Jesus Christ, of authentic salvation, and to be able to care for people. And while I know I'm getting a bit worked up talking about this, but I do want to to know here, people who identify as gay, lesbian, transgender, they are not an enemy. There is no human being that is our enemy. Our enemy is the prince of darkness, the father of lies. He is our enemy. And he has ensnared people with false ideas, with disordered attractions. And our job is to graciously reach out to people who have been ensnared and to continually renew ourselves because the devil wants to rope us up every day in his lies and in his temptations. So that's what I would take from this, that any anger you may feel, you see a pride flag, this or that, it is not towards the people who have been ensnared in an error, in a lie, in a sin. It's the devil. And we have to, using the grace that God has given us to graciously uh, represent ourselves to them and help to admonish them and move them away from that error. So back to the hymn. So Marty Hagan did gather us in. He also did We Are Many Parts. And this was the one I heard at Mass. And it was like, and here's the part. It's true. It's it's based on, you know, what Paul writes, we are we are one body. You think, um, you know, Rome was it Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 13. And, you know, we are many parts. We are all one body and the gift that we share. I also just don't like the tone. I don't like, I don't like the melodies. I don't, it just makes worship banal. It makes it something so earthy and low when music should lift us up in its grandeur up to God. And, and this song, Me or Many Parts, is the same way. It's all about us. It isn't about God. I know the theme is derived directly from Scripture, but when you just focus on that in the song, it's just, we're, we're you know, we fly the rainbow flag and sing We Are Many Parts, we're just saying it's all about us, and it's not all about us. It's all about God. Now, I'm not a Marty Hagen hater. Uh, there's one hymn that Hagen does. Uh, he's actually not—I don't believe he's Catholic. I think he's, he composed a lot of hymns for Lutherans, actually, but I think he's part of a Congregationalist church. He's Protestant. Well, maybe we shouldn't have so many Protestant hymns at the Catholic Mass. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Well, there's a, there's a shocker. But there's some that I like. There's Protestant songs that I like. Even Hagen, he has a song, Shepherd Me, O God, uh, you know, which is just based on the Psalms, you know, shepherd me, O God, beyond my wants. Be And so it, that takes you back to, to the Psalms. And I like that the melody involves, so I'm not a, not a hater. I think there are some that are good there. But when the focus is just on us and to say this is Pride Month to celebrate this disordered behavior and attraction, how sad that when we keep the focus on us, it's not going to be able to be on Christ. And if it is on Christ, it's on the non-judgmental buddy Jesus who loves us no matter what we do. Not the Jesus who loved people so much, he called them to repentance even when they were going to murder him with rocks. So look at what St. Paul says. If we're, going to, if we're going to boast about anything, like to have pride in something, to boast not about our own identities— Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1, 28, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 28 through 31, God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. He is the source of your life in Christ Jesus, whom God made our wisdom, our righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let him who boasts boast of the Lord. In Galatians 6, 14 through 15, Paul says, But far be it from me to glory except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
by which the world has been crucified to me, and I to the world. For neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. And I would say, if I'm going to boast, I'm going to boast in in Christ, in the cross of Christ. I'm not going to boast in a sexual orientation, an ethnicity, a nationality. In the end, that counts for nothing. The Catholic Church should not, we should not, at first, rely on secular symbols to communicate what we believe, but especially secular symbols who, whose core purpose, like the rainbow flag, is to articulate moral truths that sex is not something that God created towards uniting husband and wife. The rainbow flag rejects that. It rejects the idea that uh, we are bound to God's desires and plan for us and our sexuality instead of us making up all of the rules. And to, to fly that, you start down the path towards taking religion from being the awe-inspired and gracious uh, reception of what God in his majesty and glory has revealed to us into a humanistic construction that takes that even that for some people they're atheists they're they're atheistic theologians in the church atheistic clergy it's a good job for them and they want to help people and God is just an idea and they want to help people or people who may believe in God but they think God doesn't care what we do God will get us all to heaven. We just Our job is to make heaven here on earth. Our job is to preach the gospel to all nations. And people say, St. Francis, well, preach the gospel, use words if necessary. St. Francis never said that. Words, it'd be like if I said, love your spouse, use words if necessary. That would be cruel. You should love your spouse with your words, but not just your words your words and your actions. And the same is with our faith. Our faith, we love our neighbor with our words by sharing the truth about Jesus Christ and with our actions by supporting our neighbor. In the letter of James says, how can you love your neighbor? You, you say to him, be warm, be fed, but you don't give him clothes, you don't give him food. So it's always about finding the balance. You don't want to be pure social justice warriors, and you also don't want to be a fire and brimstone preacher that could care less about the poor. There's always a balance, and when we study scripture, we see that, we study scripture, the catechism, the fathers, what the church authentically teaches us in the magisterium, and we get that. So, and I hope that you get that. So when the issue of should Catholics fly the pride flag, uh, if should that come up, uh, what I would say is you should tell people the symbol that we believe in that gives us uh, hope, that shows God's universal love, is the cross. In fact, let me, let me bring here uh, Cardinal Collins up in Toronto, he said uh, that the the Sacred Heart actually should be, let's see, uh, here we go. In a March 23rd letter, he, he proposed, fine, if you want a symbol, here's a symbol to show God's love and that our Catholic schools love everyone, regardless of who they are. That is not a secular symbol opposed to the faith. And this is good for June, by the way, because June is Pride Month. It says, in a March 23rd letter, Cardinal Collins addressed all Catholic school board trustees, directors of education, and all Catholic institutions about the sacred heart of Jesus, which he called the sign of Christ's true compassionate love that all young people deserve. He noted that the feast of the sacred heart of Jesus falls on June 11th, and that June is celebrated in the church as the month of the sacred heart. He encouraged the celebration of this feast and the month. I ask all Catholic schools to focus throughout June, the month of the Sacred Heart, on this profound symbol of what our life in Christ is all about, of what Catholic education is all about. So, good for you. Good work, Cardinal. That, that's what we need to be doing. So, it's not enough just to say this secular symbol contradicts our faith, and that's not what we should offer. Instead, we should offer symbols our faith already has that are powerful, like the cross or the Sacred Heart. So if someone says you're celebrating Pride Month, you could say, oh, well, I'm celebrating the month of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, whose heart was poured out for everyone, regardless of sexual orientation, identity, desire, uh, past, whatever, whoever you are, God calls us to be a new creation in Christ and to grow closer to him. And the devotion of the Sacred Heart is a wonderful way to do that. So I hope this is helpful for you all. And I hope that you have a very blessed day. Hey, thanks for watching this video. If you want to help us produce more great content like this, be sure to click subscribe and go to trenthornpodcast.com to become a premium subscriber. You'll help us create more videos like this and get access to bonus content and sneak peeks of our upcoming projects.